had the great, great fortune to be able to go and visit Austria with Zepp Holzer. Um, I spent over 30 days studying with him now between the United States and going abroad. And for me, really being able to see uh, the Kramerderhof and even his new farm, farms that he had actually developed properly, it was a really incredible experience because I've seen projects that he did in the United States and I've heard him talk about projects a lot, but actually seeing some of the results um, from some of his real projects, it's, it's a whole another level. Now I actually understand what I'm shooting for uh, and kind of the, the way we're headed. And his son, Joseph, who now owns the Kramerderhof and gives tours of the Kramerderhof, uh, he had a really wise thing that the, the end is not the goal, but the path. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get on the proper path. Um, and so that's, that's a really wise thing. So this is us at uh, his new place, the Holzerhof. It's in the driest, hottest part of Austria. To give you an idea, the Kramerderhof is four and a half degrees centigrade mean annual temperature. The Holzerhof is nine degrees centigrade. So it's got twice the temperature. Uh, and it's, it's a much more prone to desert climate. They're having lots of, for example, the year that we were, this year, they're having the worst drought that they've had in a long, long time, and the entire corn crop has failed. Uh, and so the EU is giving out huge subsidies to farmers to offset their failed crop. Now, this doesn't seem like a very smart idea because they're basically rewarding poor farming practices, but that's, that's the world that we're in. So I'm going to get a little bit into his place now. Uh, so 10 years ago, he took on this project and he built terraces. He planted trees and vines, and then he did nothing else, absolutely nothing. It was unmanaged, untouched for 10 years. He had a dispute with this woman. So he, he came in, he made terraces, he made ponds, planted trees, planted grapevines, and then nothing for the next 10 years. So keep that in mind, because I think that's a very big point. And now, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, he's just loaded with food. I mean, walnuts, hazelnuts, berries, fruit, just lying on the ground, covering the canopy, feeding the wildlife, feeding him, feeding the soil. Uh, and before, this property was totally dry. And the farmer sold it because he couldn't produce anything on it anymore, and he thought it wasn't worth anything. And so now, Zeph's here, and he knows what he wants to do, and he knows how to do it, and this is when it will really start transforming. So you can already see after 10 years, the ecosystem is greatly enhanced. I mean, this is, when you look next door, it's just corn monoculture producing nothing in this year because it was too dry. And here it's just loaded with fruit, every kind that you can imagine, berries, nuts, everything. There's water, even though they're in the worst drought that they've had in maybe 20 years, and they've had no rain for the last two months, his ponds still had plenty of water. Uh, and this is only water from the sky. No creek, no springs, no streams. This is just water from the sky. Uh, and it's stored, it's collected over no, uh, numerous years, and then it's put to proper use. One of the big things that I took away is you need to learn how to communicate with nature. You need to learn what, how to talk with nature, how to observe it, and how to read it properly. And you need to let time and nature work for you. You need to think ahead and plan ahead so that time and nature are always working with you to meet your goals. And then, once you get set in a direction like this, you tweak a little here, you tweak a little there, and what you end up with is a garden of abundance. You have all the resources of nature. Uh, you have the sun, it can't shine bright enough because your plants are absorbing it all. The water, it can't rain enough because it's being saturated into the earth body. Drought isn't a problem because the earth body is saturated and you've stored all of the water from the sky that you've got and everything feels fine. Everything feels good. This is nature. This is how it naturally works. Any human across the planet would feel fine living this way. No one would have to starve. And so this is the model that we need to move back to. Um, and so what we're really trying to produce is edible landscapes and landscapes that are productive and valuable. One of the big things that clicked into place this time is walnut 
is an expensive wood. Chestnut is an expensive wood. Cherry is an expensive wood. Pear is an expensive wood. All of these trees, not only are they productive in giving you food and all sorts of value-added goods that you can produce from that, but then when they're past their maturity, when your kids inherit the property and they're putting in new fruit trees and taking out the old ones, all of that wood as lumber is the most expensive lumber there is. So this idea of growing a pine monoculture that's not productive while it's growing and it's not a very high resale value wood, there are better ways, better ways to do it. And it's just so much as possible. And so not only do you get this productive landscape that is also producing money for you, but it's also beautiful. There are blossoms year round, there's fruit in excess, you have the valuable wood, and you have high quality edible forests and diversity, and that's what makes a really resilient system. <coughs> diversity and symbiosis. What's the rainfall there, Zach? Uh, the rainfall is half of what the Kramerhof is, and so I, I believe the Kramerhof is 800 millimeters a year, and this is 400 millimeters. Well, uh, so Kramerhof 24, this place 12 to 15. That 12 to 15? Uh-huh. Huh. huh. Maybe it's 500. It's it, just being there. I'm not sure the exact, but it, it's in the 15 range. Um, and so, not only that, but then you have the different roots operating, uh, occupying different strata. You have deep-rooted plants sucking up moisture. You have shallow-rooted plants. All these different root zones working together, uh, and you have an earth body that four to five meters deep is full of life and is working for you. Uh, and that's, that's very important, and that's something that we don't even approach with our modern agriculture. And so there's a constant regeneration of roots, constant source of moisture and water in the soil, and each organism helps another. Each one has its own role. This is a slope that I just love. It was beautiful, so steep, and just looks like it would landslide, totally erode. And so we were... Um, checking out some earth shelters that you guys will see pictures of as well. And someone was saying, aren't you worried about that landsliding and taking out the earth shelters? And he just looked at us all foolishly and kind of chuckled and said, when you understand and you can see what the roots look like under that, you'd understand that that's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's just all the different roots. It, he builds deep soil is what he's doing. He's using the soil that's in the ground. We're always working with the top 12 inches or something. Most people with their gardens not getting any deeper than that. And what he's doing is saying, how can I get life as deep into the soil horizon as possible? And so what, what do you do? What if you trick nature? If you trick nature and try and work against it, then everything needs the same thing at the same time. A big field of corn needs the moisture at the same time of year from the same location at the same time, and it's not there. And everything is in competition with itself. Then everything's drying out, it's dying out, uh, you're getting crop failure, and it's all under stress. It's, they're all, all the plants, the humans, the animals, everything that lives off of these systems are victims for disease. Uh, and stress is the root of all disease. Stress is the root of disease. And this is true for animals, humans, plants. And so when we treat the things lower on the totem pole than us this way, that stress builds up to us and anxiety happens. Uh, and so everything is in competition when you're trying to work in this way that's tricking nature, that you're just doing one thing. Uh, the place that I've been living, the farmer uses, the farmer next door uses 80 different Monsanto chemicals throughout the course of the year. Um, 80? 80. 80 different ones. Because you got to hit everything. 8-0. Eight 8-0. Zero. Eight zero. And he's a, he's a wonderful, sweet man. He's a very nice guy, but he's destroying the planet as quickly as he can. Unintentionally. And so first they come through and they just spray everything with the tractor. Then they come through with the crop duster. But the more catastrophic part of this is he has a big pivot system that's pumping 1,100 gallons per minute out of the ground. And so all of the water that he's pumping up out of the ground, it's creating a big void down in there in the water table. And so it's sucking surface water back down. So what he's doing is he's pumping out groundwater, 
then he's filling it with Monsanto chemicals and contaminating all the groundwater for everybody. And this is something that our children, generations from now, are going to have to deal with. This is a giant feedlot in California. These are all animals wallowing in their own shit. And so they need antibiotics and all sorts of things. No wonder. They're not supposed to live that way. That's cruelty. Uh, and so there are, there are much better ways. Is that the Harris Ranch? I don't know where. It's, it's one of the big ones in Southern California. You guys probably know better than me. But so what we're going for is diversity, not simplicity. Look at this. I mean, it was amazing. The grapes are just growing like weeds over everything. I mean, growing over the fruit trees. You would think that they had been manicuring it like crazy, but this is no management. This is just letting nature do its thing. And then if you start working with nature and tweaking it, oh my god, just 10 times more is possible. And so you, you're you going for symbiosis. That's the path that you're trying to find, is symbiosis, everything working together. Um, and so everything has its own place. The pigs come through and till everything up, then you seed it, then you bring the grazers through, then you bring the poultry through to take care of all the pests for the grazers, then maybe you bring the pigs back through. It, Every organism has its own role and its own purpose, and we're always in competition and we're working against nature. So if there's a bug, we're thinking, how do we kill that bug? How do we get rid of it? But that bug is playing a valuable role, and it's indicating something to us. And if we don't know how to communicate with nature, then we'll just keep fighting it, and we'll keep fighting it forever. You're never going to beat nature. Uh, and so learning how to read those signals and use them appropriately is the most important part. Um, okay, next one. And so we, for, we forget how to learn and read from nature, and we all want the same thing at the same time. I think this is true how we approach the plant world, how we approach the animal world, and how we approach our own culture. We're all going for the same thing at the same time, and everything's in competition. And then you don't get it because you're all going for the same thing. And then scarcity starts to become an issue. And then stress builds up and violence and angst. Angst for the future because you're worried about what's going to happen. And angst is the worst companion in life. That's where all the problems come from, fear. Um, and so to see the alternative and to see what nature can do in 10 years with no care, no maintenance, and to know that 10 times more could be done if there was care and maintenance, it was just incredible. I mean, this one 10-hectare uh, property could probably have fed 100 people pretty easily. Okay. And that's, that's with no care, no How maintenance. How big is that in acres? Uh, that's tw about, it's, it's technically 9 hectares, so uh, about 20 acres. And this is just four and a half hectares of it. So this is just half of that property. Uh, so his system really came into peace for me with this trip. One thing that he said that I thought was very pointed is the ponds would not work without the terraces. If it weren't for the terraces, the ponds would fill up and dry out. And he'd have this big, dusty bowl of clay. Uh, but what the terraces do, and the trees on the terraces, the trees have the mother function and what they're doing is they're allowing water to seep and percolate through the earth body. And so three months after a rain, he's still having water seeping down these terraces into his pond. And so if it weren't for the terraces, these ponds wouldn't exist and wouldn't work properly. It's a very important part of his system. Um, and so you can multiply this all over the world, anywhere it can be done. For different climates, you have different biomes, uh, and there's so many possibilities, so many different things that can be done. And this is what we should be learning in school. This is what we should be practicing in school. And kids should have the possibility to learn from this and to try it out. They already do it naturally, but we just put them into a different box and basically hamper that development. So now I'm going to go through a couple of his projects, and then I'll kind of come back to the trip that we had in Austria. This is uh, his project in Kazakhstan. And so for you guys who haven't seen this, uh, I show this because in Bozeman, this is a very analogous climate to us. Montana and Kazakhstan are actually sister nations. 
uh, they exchange information about policy and problem solving because they have such similar climates. And Kazakhstan is actually where the apple comes from, interestingly enough, uh, the wild apple. And so this is the property, his first analysis through it, uh, and you're always looking for the water. The water is the most important thing. And so you can see with this property, the water is just shooting right through it. It's moving through it very quickly. And so what you're going for is moving it back and forth across the landscape, storing as much as possible. Everywhere gets enough rainwater. It's just a matter of if you're storing it and caring for it and using it properly. So that's what he's trying to do with this. Um, and so this is kind of the conceptual of where he wants to go with the water. And then this is the plan for the site. Uh, and I believe this is, um, I'm not sure exactly how big, uh, but I think this is the 10,000 hectare project. But I'm not positive. And so each one of these are their own little house lot. And each family has one hectare. And that hectare produces all the food, all the material that that family needs. And so there's a city center here. There's almost water on every side of most of these houses. Um, water can be used as a transport system for this type of community. And it's just, it's such a beautiful, happy way of living. Just a quick question. Is that all hand drawn? Did you use like topographical maps as a basis to add features? He has an architect who does this, and so I'm not sure exactly which program he uses. Uh, I use Google SketchUp for my designs because um, it's free. That's nice. Uh, but his architect, Jens Kirchhoff, uh, produces a lot nicer stuff than me, and I know he's using a fancy program. And so this is a zoom up of the town. So it's got everything, hospital, school, all of that kind of stuff. And so the community aspect is something that doesn't get talked a lot about by him or um, even by a lot of people in permaculture. But without the community, the systems don't have anyone to care for them. And so that's his biggest problem traveling around the world, putting in these systems, is that no one cares for them after, or doesn't care for them properly after, and they don't become what they could be. Um, and any questions that you guys have, I'm happy to answer, so just raise your hand and pop them out. Um, so this is a cross section of that. And so what he's doing is he's digging out waterways and he's building up berms. And he's using that as a number of things, water storage obviously, but then also uh, wind protection and climate protection. And so this is where he kind of came up with the idea for a crater garden. A crater garden is basically a sunken garden, uh, a terrace sunken garden that comes down into the ground. And so maybe it's like that, and this is great. And so you have a berm on the outside, you have water retention in the middle, uh, and what you're doing is you're making an enhanced microclimate. Plants can survive a lot if they don't have stress. And wind and water blowing across them, that's their main stress in the winter. Desiccation, where I am, that's the main stress in the summer, basically. Hot, dry winds just blowing through everything. And so these berms stop both of those problems because what happens is the wind comes in and it makes a little vortex here, and it turns out that the easiest way for the wind to travel is over the whole thing. So interestingly enough, not only do you get wind protection in here, but you actually get some wind protection out here as well because of that vortexing. Can you get a summer so it gets more hot in there? Uh, you know, it actually, it, as long, if you have water in the bottom, it stays really nice. Because the water does a lot of cooling with its evaporation. And so you'll end up with a warm, humid climate in the bottom. If you don't have water in the bottom, then you could definitely get really hot and dry in there. Would you put plants on the top terrace to help yep. the moisture, like the canopy? Yeah, yeah, and I'll get to that with one that we did, but what we're usually doing is planting thorny, nitrogen-fixing, soil-building plants nice. up high that just so happen to usually be really acclimated to desert climates. Cool. And then you have more of your heavy feeders down low in the moister, more fertile. Uh, rains of the crater garden. So do you have to uh, amend the soils or the, the waterways so that they retain water? Uh, you're, you're not amending the waterways so much as 
reshaping the earth body and using the natural layering that's in place as wisely as you can to store as much water as you can. Uh, and so I'll actually, I think it might even be the next slide, yeah. This is a great drawing. This is one of the schematics for building that. And so you can see how the excavators are operating, driving along terraces, digging out, building up. But this is Zep's dam system. Um, it's a little bit different than a lot of other ones, but a lot similar to a lot of other ones as well. And so what you have is an impermeable clay layer. Whatever you have, the first one that you hit the best. Uh, and then you're using that to build what's called a keyway dam. So basically a big block of clay at your constriction point in the valley. And that enables you to get the most bang for your buck in terms of water catchment. The other thing that this does is it makes it, if you just dig a liner pond, you just have water there. When you do a dam like this, you have water not only here, but here, here, and all, everything uphill of it. And because of the wicking that soil has, uh, you're actually even raising the groundwater level uphill of where you're putting in the pond system. And so this is what's providing the moisture, and this is what's preventing drought and fire, and it's also what's providing the water for all the cultivated plants, uh, forest gardens, fruit trees, all that kind of stuff. And so does everyone have a pretty good read on a Keyway Dam and how this functions? Any questions on this? Well, yeah, I got one question. Is the blue areas, is that underground water? Yes. Okay. And so that's, what that is, is let's say uphill here we have a loading surface. We have water percolating into the ground. And so that water is flowing underground. And that's the water that he's catching with this barrier wall. Basically, before he did this, the water would just flow underground and flow right by. And there wouldn't be any surface water, and it would be dry on the surface. But once you put in a keyway dam, what happens is this starts filling up and rising, and even up to here, and then it starts wicking up these terraces. Um, and so obviously you still get drier zones and wetter zones, but the earth body is saturated. It's full of moisture. The voids in it are filled with water. But that, that was basically, was that basically flat land or is there? Is yes, there? this project is pretty much flat land. Wow. Yeah. So you put a dam in flat land? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of nothing's like ever flat. Yeah, right. And this is actually rivers flow through here. So it's a major drainage. It's in the valley. So it, it's flat-ish land, but it has a lot of water moving through it because it has mountains uphill of it. Do you mind if I add a couple of things? Yeah. Uh, one is, you see the dam is actually connecting to this layer mm. here. That's really critical to make this work. And then the whole design is not meant to seal the water, like you've mentioned, but mm. it took me a while to understand. It is, there is this impermeable layer, but it's meant that the water can go out, which is very different. And then the third thing uh, is, the compaction of this is important, and they're using the same material in this. So, you're using this material for that or another location if you find it. Mm -hmm. Also, they're digging down to put that block in. Right? Yes, you do need you, you basically you need to dig into that layer to get a good bind to it. Are you getting the clay from another digging site, or? Uh, usually, you can just get it from the deep zone of your pond. If you have a setup like this, you can basically dig out the deep zone of your pond use that clay for it and then reinforce your dam. This should be a one to two, one to two on the other side of the dam. Dam should always be crowned. If you have anything that's not, uh, like roads or driving on it or any, any depressions in it, what you're gonna have is water percolating into it, freezing, expanding, making cracks. Over the years, the cracks get bigger and bigger until they eventually enable water because water has such a tiny head, if, especially when water has pressure on a big body of water like this, It'll work through any little constriction it will, can. And so that's why putting trees on a dam is not very good because the roots can actually go all the way through and then the water will wick out the roots and all of a sudden you have water. Once you have water moving through your dam, you're just screwed. That thing is gonna blow, it's gonna landslide and you don't wanna be responsible for it. Um, so it's very important that your dam is shedding all of the water. It's also important that the clay is at the right moisture when it's compacted. If it's too wet, you basically you can't get it tight enough uh, because clay goes like 
when it gets wet. It, it has a ton of surface area because it's actually a crystal. Uh, so that crystalline structure is what gives it such immense life-giving capabilities. It stores nutrients very well, but also water very well. And so if it's too wet, you can't compact it tight enough. And when it dries out, it's gonna crack and your dam's put. If it's too dry, you can't pack it tight enough. And then once it hydrates, it's gonna loosen up and then your dam's put and you're screwed. Um, I was going to add one more thing. When you're, when you're digging clay for a pond or something like this, if you go through the bottom of it, you got to repair that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you can get drain up and you screw everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you got to be very careful with your layering. Depends, uh, like, how the layers are because you might have more than one. Yeah. And some places, you know, like down over Montana, we got 180 feet of clay. <coughs> yeah. But other places in California, where they got two feet. Yeah. Definitely. Exactly. Um, maybe you can talk about it a little bit, but one important piece is also how you tie the sides of the dam, in, in the, the, the ends of the dams into the side. Mm -hmm. That's important, and yeah. I have never seen it done. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So and and I'm not quite sure how this really works well. I don't know. It brings up a good point about the spillway. Your spillway right. should always run over undisturbed ground. You cannot run the spillway over your dam because the dam, when you move, you're, not, you're never able to settle it as well as nature does. And so no matter how much level of compaction or whatever you apply to it, you can't compact it as well as what was there. And that's why you always want to run your spillway over uh, undisturbed ground. And so that kind of brings in Richard's point that you have, let's say, let's say downhill is this way. You have a valley. Um, like this, these are topographic lines, for example. And so you want to build a keyway dam right here that's, let's say this is, these are one meter lines. And so you're going to build a, a three meter high dam here. And that's going to give you this whole body of water. And so what you need to do is that needs to run around all the way. Um, and it shouldn't be just circular like this. It should wave all over the place. That would be angry for that. Um, <laughs> It's cheaper to build this way, but it's not natural, so that's why you don't do it this way. So the spillway should always come out over undisturbed ground, be it over here, be it over here, or sometimes you can build the dam big enough that you can just feed the spillway off somewhere over here, and that's the best, that's the safest. Basically, the farther away from your dam you can get your spillway, the safer you are. How deep are we talking? For this one? Yeah. Uh, let's see, these are a meter and a half terraces, or a meter and a half wide, uh, I think about one meter tall. Um, these are one-to-one -one slopes, so we're about one, two, three, probably four meters deep. Does it say? Here's, okay, so that's three meters. So this pond is four and a half meters deep. The pond okay. goes down to the deep zone. What's that? Mm -hmm. 15. Uh, yeah, 15. About 15 feet. Okay. Uh, so this is an overhead of that site. Gives you kind of an idea for the topography. So it's this flat, it's a valley, basically. Um, and that's why it's got all this water flowing through it. And this is the conceptual for what it will look like after they do it. I think this project's slated to happen either this year or early next year. Um, and so this will be a really beautiful big one when it's done. So this is a great section from something else, not that project. Uh, but I like to use this to demonstrate how water is supposed to flow through the landscape. And some of the problems that we've already done to the landscape. So we should have nice forest systems up high on the landscape. Even bodies of water up high on the landscape. So that the water, as it's coming down, it's getting stopped into each one of these bays. And the forests are storing it, and they're basically preventing desiccation, and they're also providing uh, the canopy cover for the water to be able to percolate in. Because what happens when the, when the soil is warmer than the falling rain, it rejects the falling rain, and it can't absorb it. When the soil is cool enough, it just soaks it right up. And so having shade for the soil is very important. So to go into a little bit of our farming, our forestry practices, 
clear cutting all of this and then having a bunch of rain coming down on it basically causes all this erosion that washes out into these lower areas. And what this can do is it actually it plugs up streams and creeks and bodies of water and it makes them really high and wide. And what will eventually happen, and this can even happen over a period of 15, 20 years. I know Mark Vandermeer said he's seen, I think like 12 creeks that this happened to in Montana where the creek sublimates goes underground and goes dry for all intents and purposes. It's, not a, it's still flowing underground, uh, but there's no surface water. And it's from these forestry practices, from loosening up all of these natural terraces that the trees are creating, albeit small, causing all of this erosion, all of that sediments plugging up, making it so that they're really wide, shallow bodies of water. And then that water is actually sublimating because there's not enough water flowing through it and it's flash flooding. Um, and so when the top of your landscape is all screwed up, that really hampers the bottom of your landscape. Because here's where you feel all the effects of it. Here's where you're gonna get the really bad flooding, the really bad drought, all of that kind of stuff. Because the mountains are what gives us fertility. The mountains collect all the water and they just funnel it right to us. And so if we can work with them, we're at a very big advantage. So the, now we're back 